The National Film and Video Foundation is an agency of the Department of Arts and Culture that was created with the sole purpose to ignite stories of the South African film industry. It's a story about nurturing uniquely South African narratives through the funding of the development, production, marketing and distribution of films, festival hosting, market and festivals attendance as well as the training and development of aspiring filmmakers. Our story is about igniting your stories and we will continue to do so for as long as South Africans have stories to tell. In the past financial year, our story moved in leaps and bounds as we pursued transformation and development across all spheres of the industry. We will continue to play a leading role in addressing the needs of our stakeholders and the broader film community. Our focus towards the growth of youth and women in the industry has yielded positive results through partnerships with various provinces, strategic entities and community interventions. The National Film and Video Foundation remains committed to fueling the industry. We congratulate all the South Africans who have received both local and international accolades. We assure the industry that we will continually adhere to our duty of implementing strategic priorities with integrity, working towards improving the quality of life for every South African, while promoting equality, all through the power of the visual medium. Lesbiana, yo soy. Yo soy. I am. Hoy soy lesbiana. Yo soy lesbiana porque me gusta. Y me da la gana. Twenty-five years ago, you and I met at the lesbian tent. Twenty-five years on, here we are. Twenty-five years ago, lesbians from all over the world arrived at the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing, China, and took a stand. This year we decided to come together, not just to go down memory lane, Tag, it's so good to see you! Nice to see you too! But to also share and celebrate what was the most successful lesbian visibility campaign in history. Make this a conference for all women, regardless of their sexual orientation. We were confronting what was actually a huge uphill battle. Lesbian issues were not seen as women's issues. Most yes. people were saying the usual kind of, you're disrupting the agenda. They wanted us to tone it down. And there were rumors that we were all going to run topless through the street. They confiscated some literature at one point. We were constantly under observation. At that time, even realized how much they were afraid of us. All 40,000 uh, uh, women from all around the world had to be moved because of lesbians. It was a major lesson to the world that we are everywhere. Yeah. We can have you as a feature. First black queer lawyer. <laughs> Please. I, I just feel like such a hypocrite. So, but I tell you, my band to was good. Tell you, I'm not tired. Imagine say, "Show me my mark." To my time, the phone and didn't introduce my mom. Like I saw was going to call her, she can't meet my mom. Oh, shh. Okay, then go. Go and tell your mother. Go, go, go tell your mother about us. <laughs>
Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session for the NFVF called Beyond Production, Embracing Diversity for Queer Storylining. Um, I'm really, really, really blessed to have the NFVF um, agree to host this webinar for all of us. Um, I would like to take this moment to introduce the guests who are with us today, uh, who are gonna have this very dynamic conversation that is much needed for our uh, film and TV industry. We have got on the panel today, um, Jabu Pereira from Iranti Org. We have got Ati Patela, uh, who's just directed um, Trapped, the movie. We have got Tishweza Kubu, who is a phenomenal actress and filmmaker extraordinaire, and Dr. Beverly Ditsie, who is a veteran filmmaker and queer activist. Um, we decided um, that it is a very important time um, in the South African landscape to address the issue of queer representation in the media. Um, this was precipitated by um, an unfortunate incident that happened after um, the Q&A session of Ati Patela's movie, um, Catch It If You Can. Um, the name of the movie is called Trapped. Um, I went to the film screening of the movie Trapped, uh, directed by Ati Patela, starring Tishiwe, um, with many other amazing performers. Um, and in the screening, um, uh, it is a story about uh, a queer couple with one of the, the, the lesbian uh, couple being um, home of, um, what, what's the word, being in the closet um, when it comes to their parents. Uh, there are very many dynamics to being in the closet and the scope of being out as a homosexual person. Um, it's a very interesting story. I watched the movie. Uh, congratulations, Ati. Um, so at the Q&A, um, very interesting questions were posed, uh, but the one that struck a nerve was, um, uh, a straight actor asking uh, how Ati feels about uh, casting straight people uh, in queer characters. Now, this is a question that I remember being asked when I produced um, Society, the TV series very many years ago, over 10 years ago. Um, and it's a question that is very important to the queer community um, because represent representation matters. Um, the answer that Ati gave uh, was recorded and ended up going viral on the internet. And it, it ended up getting a lot of heated debate from very many people. Uh, and I think it's important for us to unpack that, uh, that, that issue. How do we feel as a queer community um, about having straight people being represented on TV and in film? And also, I think this is an opportunity for us as a queer community to talk to um, the straight community about how we would like to be represented, to be represented in the media, uh, but also for us as filmmakers to talk to the queer community about the challenges we have in production, specifically in the South African film and TV industry. Um, about why you can't always get what you want at the end of the day. Um, the panelists that we've got on today are very knowledgeable in this field um, that we're about to discuss. They have directed amazing movies in their own right. Um, Jabu uh, runs a queer uh, media uh, organization called Iranti. Uh, you can check it out online. Um, they do amazing advocacy work um, and um, I've done some work with the Queer Media Makers Network of Africa, uh, which is a, a network for queer, uh, queer media makers across the continent. So this is not just a South African issue. Uh, it is an issue that touches a nerve, uh, not just for Africans, but for the world at large. Um, Ati herself has directed this film that I'm talking about. Beverly has um, uh, represented us uh, um, on the world stage 
uh, in Beijing, uh, firstly, but has gone on to produce amazing films like Simon and I, and now Lesbians Save. They free. will- um, Lesbians they, Free Everyone. Lesbians Free Everyone. Um, it'll be out soon and I hope everyone gets to watch it. Uh, Tishue has starred in many amazing films. Um, they are an illustrious performer. Um, they were in a film that I produced called While You Weren't, Work While you Weren't Looking, um, produced by the, um, wow, Out in Africa, Out, Out in Africa, Africa Film Festival. Um, and I'm, I, I beg to be corrected, but I think that was the first time that Tishiwe uh, played a queer character on screen and they have, continued to um, show in, um, to, to perform in very many films with Trap being the latest one. So they will get a chance to, to talk about everything that they have done in their personal um, capacities. But for today's discussion, um, I'd like to uh, invite all my guests um, to speak on very um, questions that I've prepared, but also to invite our guests. Um, our audiences, our viewers, our listeners, to please use um, the comments section in the YouTube channel as well as on the Facebook channel. Please feel free to write your comments and um, at uh, a later stage, I will make sure that I read all the questions and I'll direct them accordingly to our panelists on, on the stage. So just to give us um, context about why this is important. Um, I'm going to start with Jabu Pereira um, and ask Jabu to please give us an overview on queer representation in the media in South Africa and broader. So please unmute yourself and Jabu, take it away. Thank you. And, and thank you to everybody for being here. Um, I just have a few points around that. I mean, um, as Iranti, we, we more engage in civic uh, journalism and using new media, digital media. And recently we've explored um, um, kind of documentary forms. So I think it's different forms of representations in various forms of media that we need to talk about when it comes to queer representation. Um, and I think the, the the one thing to acknowledge um, in, in the use of, 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 of um, film um, is the recognition that when you make film, um, you you evoke emotion um, similar to what one feels, um, and a film translates that in multiple ways. But also the 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 the, the casting of that very aspect um, relates to um, how, um, uh, how. Sorry, this I thought it was off. <laughs> Okay. okay, you're talking about the casting. I apologize. Thing. Yes. Um, so just in, in brief, I would say that queer people in media have historically suffered uh, with um, intense stereotypes by film directors and film producers, um, particularly trans people and trans bodies um, in, 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 in movies. We, we, we either as trans people are inserted as, as spaces of mockery um, as jokes, particularly trans women. And so there are historical pains and grief that relates to mainstream cinema um, and how that is, that, that is, that is relayed um, in stereotyping lesbian relationships or gay people. Um, so media itself has really to unpack its stereotypes and framing in that regard. But the fact that that cinema and uh, uses this entire word called casting in itself is highly problematic because casting in itself um, um, relates to an, an unauthentic way of being. And I think that hits hard when you start to replace queer people um, with, with uh, non-queer people or, or cis, cis straight people to, to, to represent their lives. Um, I can't imagine a white person representing a black experience in that regard. And so why should a straight person represent a gay experience? And why should a cis person represent my experience as a trans man? So I think there are, they are, they are deep um, issues that we need to really engage on when, when it comes to these issues. I think my final um, uh, issue really around queer representation, I've spoken about the stereotyping, is really that in a country like ours where we have uh, constitutional protections, um, people are highly obsessed, uh, directors, film producers, um, 
and including, I think, Iranti falls within that problem framing about um, black bodies as pained bodies, as traumatized bodies, as dead bodies, and not bodies of joy, bodies of resilience, um, bodies with experiences. And I, I think we have to recognize that queer people have created cinema, have created movies, have created theater. And there's a recognition to, to the creativity that comes with that self-introspection. When you're queer, you cannot be queer without introspecting your own, your own personal transformation. And so there's no disidentification to our experiences in that way. So I'll pause there and just say, I think uh, this is going to be a very rich engagement and thank you. Thank you so much for those very salient points, Jabu. I think, um, you know, it's one thing to have a conversation about queerness amongst queer people because all of the things that you're saying um, ring very true to us as queer people. Um, but once we extend this conversation to straight people, there might be some terminology that might not be um, um, clear or um, apparent to straight people. So just for context, um, I'd like us to just uh, demystify some, some terminology is important in this kind of conversation. So when firstly, as we're talking about queer people, this is essentially talking about the entire spectrum of LGBTIQ+, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, intersex, questioning queer and everybody else who are allies amongst us. Right. The other terminology that I think is important for us to 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 clarify is the idea of cisgendered people. Cisgendered people are people who identify as the gender in which they were born. Correct me if I'm wrong. So if you're a cisgendered woman, you could still be a lesbian woman, but you present as a woman. So when you walk out in public as a lesbian woman, you still look like a woman. You are not confusing anybody else who might not know you um, at first fa face value, right? The other thing that I think we need to clarify is the idea of um, heteronormity. Uh, being heteronormative is playing to what society expects of us as heterosexual people. We have a culture that has been portrayed for millennia on end on screen where we know what it's like, what is expected of us as heterosexual people. But a lot of homosexual people as well do out of our safety, do end up having to play heterosexual um, role playing for the public so that um, we are palatable for lack of a better term. Um, as, we, as we continue to have this conversation, I will keep trying to um, explain some of these terminologies that might be confusing to our audience. So the one thing that you mentioned um, in your intro there, Jabu, uh, which I think is a great example, is saying it would be a ludicrous um, thing for us to accept a white person playing a black character. Um, because very often people are like, oh, what's the big deal? Can we just relax? We're all just actors here, right? But once you take that example of blackface, for lack of a better word, it would be unacceptable for white people to play black people. So in this, in this sense, uh, and part of why it is important for us to have this webinar on queer storytelling, it's for us to find a middle ground on trying to represent queer people with queer actors on stage, on screen. Um, it's not always possible. So I think um, it's, it's important for us to, to talk it through because um, yeah, we will, we will get to that. So I want to now hand over to Dr. Beverly Ditsie um, to talk to us about, to really just like take it further from what Jabu has been talking uh, to us about. Um, there's, a, there's a frame that we, we all use in you know, any marginalized society, uh, whether it's the black community, the feminist movement, and in the queer movement, um, uh, the phrase, nothing about us without us. And I think once you hear that term, it becomes really clear why representation is important. So um, Bev, 
can you please give us an overview of like, you know, the work that you've done over the years? And I know you've got very strong opinions about um, queer representation, especially around nothing about us without us. Thank you, uh, Mahano. Hello, everybody. Um, I, I, look, I'm very happy to be having this conversation and it's actually quite ludicrous using that word that is happening for the first time under the NFVF banner, an organization that has existed since we, since our freedom, um, where we are in actual, actual fact, uh, part and parcel of storytelling of this country. And yet it is the first time that the NFVF is actually having this conversation. Um, it goes to show just how not represented we are. Um, we speak of representation. I see us as being misre misrepresented everywhere. Um, we are a caricature everywhere we are. In actual fact, to a degree where, unless we are entertaining or serving something, we do not exist. Trans men don't exist. I do not see Jabu on my screen. Gender non-conforming people like me do not exist on my screen. Non-binary people like Tishiwe exist only when they are framed in heteronormative terms. Mm -hmm. And that's all we are. Unless you are this or you are that, we do not exist. And so we are a figment of somebody else's imagination of who and what we should be. And that imagination comes from the caricatures that have been regurgitated throughout our media space, throughout our lifetimes. Every time we see ourselves, we see only a fraction of who we really are across the board. And so, no, we are not represented. We have not even begun to be represented. So, of course, we get excited. The first time I saw society, you know, it was the first time I was like, oh, my God, finally. And, of course, sadly, she was also then accosted. And then she was, you know, I, I think she was raped. It's, 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 it's the story of our lives that when we do actually appear anywhere, we don't have lives that are full lives. When you have our people that are on TV shows, some of my favorite TV shows, you have people who do not have healthy relationships. They are constantly being abused in their relationships. And if not that, then they are just these people who have no parents, who have no backstory, who have no life. They just appear out of nowhere and then they entertain and then they disappear. That's all we've ever been in our media space. And of course I will continue to bitch and moan about the fact that we don't exist even though we actually make a lot of this work happen. We, somebody actually wrote that you know queers hold up the entertainment space and the media space, whether these are people who are out or not out. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are still battling in 2021 to even be seen. Nothing about us without us came, I think, as part of a HIV world and, a, and, a, and, and the background to that was the fact that you have so many people and at the time it was all these scientists and all these people who were speaking about experiences that they know nothing about where it is assumed that just because you've studied something, then you have an idea of what this is. And so it then transcended from all the different activist spaces to literally mean, how do you speak about a people and write about a people when you have no clue who they are? Just because you read it does not mean that you know the lived experience and that you exist. There's been many programs that could have very easily approached Jabu. And every time I get asked, to speak on something where I know this is, this is specifically about educating, about whether it's trans or non-binary, as long as it is not heteronormative, I would say, go to Iranti. And those people would never approach Iranti because the idea in the media space is not necessarily to be educating. The idea is to be salacious. Idea is about numbers. Idea is about making money. It is not about us. And so how are we even being represented if there's so much that is about us without us? It's, it's, it's ridiculous the place where we are in 2021 in this country that is supposed to be this country that is lauded with the, the best constitution in the world that we can't even access. And so, you know, with every single job that I do, you know, whether it is behind the scenes in my crew or whether it is 
on camera itself, I try to make sure that there is some level of representation that is not just a caricature, but a full human, the full person that we are. Um, and unfortunately it is pulling teeth. We, we are pulling teeth to make sure whether it is our producers or whether it is the broadcaster or whether it is the funder, we are constantly pulling teeth to make sure that we exist in our spaces. Wow, um, and thank so you I'll so leave much. It because, I mean, we can go on, so, you know. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for giving us that full overview, Bev. And I, I appreciate the fact that you are so passionate about this because if we, are not passionate about how we are represented. It will always be the sideline, um, the sideline conversation. So I'm hoping that everybody that is watching this, um, this webinar uh, can hear us from a place of um, an open mind because if this had been an issue that was uh, uh, a strong point in any aspect of your life, you would be justified to feel just as passionate as Bev does. And I think it is important to acknowledge that Bev has been doing this for longer than most people have been alive. This is a triggering um, conversation just to be involved in this conversation as it is. Um, and it is important for us to fix our own issues. Um, long gone are the days where we are expecting for but to fix our problems. We are here to fix our own problems. And as you premised your, your introduction, you know, you were just talking about the irony that we're having this conversation on this NFVF platform. And I really do applaud the NFVF for picking up my call when I called um, the marketing department uh, and asking them to please, to please help us host this conversation. It is not good enough for us to have this conversation as us preaching to the choir. Um, if we're having this conversation amongst just queer people, it would be a conversation that we've had for decades. So I, you know, ask them if they would be willing to at least make this a national key point conversation and they did not hesitate. They were like, yes, um, yes, it's time for us to have this conversation. And I'd really just like to give them a thumbs up because we don't learn until we are having a teachable moment. Um, given what you have said, and it was a lot, babe, we, will, we will unpack all the, the main, the, 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 the points. I feel like you've given us chapter headings in everything mm -hmm. that you said. Given that you, what you've said um, and that it is uh, the opinion of very many people, um, the, one of the things that uh, had us wanting to start this conversation for a global platform was because uh, the hate that Ati, experienced online on Twitter after her response to the question that I, I mentioned earlier about why would you cast a straight person in a queer character? The hate that she received, I felt was unprecedented. Um, and I feel like not just in a queer space, there has just been like a blanket uh, cancel culture around, um, around anything that people find uh, to their disliking. Um, so I think it's important for us to, to, to acknowledge that we are living in an era where um, we are living online on an online platform where people have the right to freedom of speech um, and can express their opinions as, as and how they wish. Uh, but in this specific case, Ati was um, the victim of cyberbullying uh, on Twitter. And I would like to invite Ati to, to, to come and address all of us about her experience of, first of all, directing the film Trapped, uh, which is a queer film, a lesbian story, a beautifully told lesbian story, and subsequently the experience that she had um, online when she was being cyberbullied on Twitter, uh, especially around the, I, the, the, the cancel culture that has become pervasive. So Ati, um, please unmute yourself and um, over to you. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I feel so blessed to be here listening to all the knowledge. Thank you so much, Bev. Um, and thank you, Jabu. Thank you so much, Mahana. Um, so for me, so Trapped was deliberately, and I keep saying, like a queer film. 
um, because we don't see, like Bev was saying, happy queer stories. And queer people, we have lives. We're daughters, we're friends, we're sons, we're a lot of things. And, and every time we see those stories on screen, it's almost as though that part of us doesn't exist and all the other parts, you know, are the ones that come in the forefront. So with, with Trapped, it was a day-to-day in the life of a queer person who has a job, who is a daughter, who has a lover, you know, and it was deliberately that, and it, it has a very happy ending deliberately because queer stories, there are queer stories with happy endings. And like Jabu was saying, there's a lot of happy happening in queer. It's not like bodies of, of aches and pains all the time. And so that's why firstly, it was um, positioned the way it was. And secondly, um, I was very lucky, and I and I did say in, in the screening when we we're doing the QA that I was very lucky to have casted good queer people to play queer roles, which for me I felt like they did justice to the story. And that's why I was saying in the in the forefront, perhaps it would not have been me considering a queer person, but I was lucky because wow, they came and they carried it. So I didn't have to look outside of who um, the bodies that I would like the, the film to, to carry are. So I had original people doing original things, playing themselves. Um, so the experience was really beautiful. It was amazing. The energy was great. Um, everybody who came through in the story embodied the story and they wore their characters with so much grace and I'm really grateful. So that was my experience of directing it. Um, then the cyberbullying came. So when it came, I was, I was, I wasn't sure what to reply and and what I was fighting because I I shot a queer film and I casted queer people. So then the headlines were, she says she would never cast queer people. So I was also like, I I don't know. I'm not sure what I'm fighting because I did cast queer people. Um, I just said in the forefront would not have been the fact that you're queer. It would have been the fact that you embody the story. Um, And for me as a director, personally, I'm not saying it's a universal thing. I'm just saying for me, it would have been that because I feel like my politics are already clear. If I'm doing a queer story, it means that I want to represent queerness at its utmost best. And that's why I'm doing a queer film. So with that said, I I did feel like my politics were clear um, in terms of where my storytelling lies. It lies in telling amazing, beautiful, happy queer stories. And that's what I did with amazing queer people. And that's what I did. So yeah, the cyberbullying did, did um, it left me wondering what I am arguing, or rather what I would reply to and, and, and say, um, which I suppose is great because now we're having this conversation. And Mahani, you said something quite important when you said it is hard to, to find um, queer characters that will, that, will be, that will embody roles. And not because there aren't, and, and, and again, the space isn't safe. So who's going to come out and say, I am queer? Because again, Twitter's gonna have you. So it's like, I will die if I do, I'll die if I don't. And that's why a lot of people, great actors don't come and say I'm queer because the space isn't safe because of the cyber winning. So yeah, I'm quite excited that this conversation is happening and I hope we can unpack and unlearn and learn more and hopefully walk away better and we'll walk away with the industry pushing towards being better and hopefully fixing mistakes and adding more greatness in the queer space in the media. Thank you so much, um, Ati, for sharing your very um, unfortunate consequences of what was a beautiful film. Um, I'm glad you get a, a chance on a national platform to your side of the story. It's unfortunate that um, you are having to legitimize your queerness um, for you to endorse your film. Um, And I think it's very important for for straight people to understand that it is not our responsibility to come out for you to be comfortable with what we do in our private lives. Um, Like Ati mentioned, um, coming out is a matter of safety. Uh, We are all aware, and if you're not, you should. We are all aware that um, there are very many hate crimes that happen to homosexual people in this country. People are being maimed, people are being raped, and all kinds of atrocities happen to queer people because of the conservative nature of our country. Um, So I don't know in what world do we expect actors to you know, raise their hands and say, hey, I'm queer, cast me, because 
worst case scenario, then those queer actors are now being expected to only act in queer parts. Um, and that would be an unfortunate situation. As much as we do want queer people to only act, uh, to, as much as we do want queer people to act in queer roles, um, we don't have that many queer people that are out the closet um, to have to our disposal to act in the very many queer stories that have not been told yet. I'm sure there are so many queer stories that are on people's laptops, the scripts that haven't been produced because they just aren't that many queer actors to our disposal. So um, given that, um, I would like to invite Tishiwe um, to speak to us. They are a phenomenal performer. Um, as a disclaimer, I'd like to make it very clear to everybody watching today that Tishiwe's pronouns are they and them. And it is important for us to respect people's pronouns, regardless of what you might think they visually present or what you might remember them as. It is very important for us to acknowledge that people come with diverse pronouns. So Tishiwe's pronouns are they and them, and they were playing a lesbian character in this movie. Now, Tishue is somebody that I've worked with um, uh, over the years. Um, like I said previously, they played um, a wonderful character in a movie that I produced before called uh, While You Weren't uh, Looking. It's a feature film. And recently we were storylining in a telenovela called Titapo for SABC2. Um, there were three queer people who were, uh, storyliners for the series, which is such a treat for you as a queer person to be the majority in a story. It's something that I had never experienced before. And what was wonderful about that experience is the energy that changed in the room um, as a result. So I'd like to invite Tishue as somebody that has acted in queer films, that has written for queer stories and has got very strong opinions about being a trained actor um, to speak to their experience. Um, Tishue, uh, I invite you to unmute yourself and um, if you're here, um, please um, address us. It seems like Tishue's um, network is a little shaky. Um, so I will, I will continue to speak about that because like I said, I am, not just an actress, I'm a director, um, a writer and uh, a producer, um, but I want to go further into that. The idea of um, audiences being upset, and I th I'm now gonna address everybody in front of us. The idea of uh, the queer community being upset about the kinds of queer characters that we see on our screen is an issue that I think we should all take seriously. And I'm saying this, to producers of content on our screens. This is for both film and TV. I, I, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that allies are important um, and, and we should allow them to tell queer stories. So part of the, 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 the intention of this webinar is to help people find the language and the, 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 the guidelines to tell these stories. So I'm gonna invite Bev um, to, to maybe speak to us about how you have navigated uh, this in, in the productions that you, you have produced in the past. Um, you know, Mahano, I would like to just kind of go backwards a little bit, um, just sure. in terms of the cyber bullying and, and the responses that were on social media after Ati's film, after actually that one clip came out, let me be honest with you. I caught like about 15, the last 15 minutes of the film. It was phenomenal. I love seeing Tashiwa on screen. Um, I, lo I loved the film. I loved it. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, but I was one of the people who actually expressed my, oh my God, no, she did not say that. I am one of those people. And, you know, we need to be able to agree or disagree with respect and be able to name things because we are here, right? So it is not that RT did not cast or cast a queer person. Or it is in how, and we've had this conversation, RT. It is in how, in that clip, in that one moment 
all we heard at a time when we are hurting in this community. This is just after there's all this whole Mac MacGyver. This is, there's so much violence going on. And in this moment, while we are all raw all over social media, one of us then says, I am not going to cast a queer person. You must work harder. You must be better. I am, I to be where I am, have to work harder and be better. So you must be better. It just did not, it is how it came across. I was also triggered. And everyone else who was saying, what does she mean? What does she mean? What does she mean we must be better? What does she mean there are no queer people? What, what do you mean? That's where that came from. And yes, of course, a lot of the people who were doing the attacking had not even seen the film. Did not even see that these were there were so many queer characters in the film itself. So I mean, you know, this is uh, this is not new RT, right? Because we actually had this conversation where I admitted that you know I was one of the people who was saying, "What do you mean?" Um, so sometimes it is in the nuance. Sometimes it is in how we say the things that we say that get people triggered. But I do agree that we do actually jump. We jump very high. Sometimes we don't even care th about the context with which people speak and we jump, but it also comes from a place of hurt. We wouldn't be having this conversation if we already had representation, if we already had a whole lot of phones where we see ourselves and all our diversity, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It wouldn't matter whether somebody is queer or not, as long as they're playing the role and it is, it really is truly representative of who we are. It wouldn't matter, but it does simply because there's so few and far. And so that is why people are hurt. People are hurt and we get hurt by little things because we are constantly being hurt. And that's where that came from for me. And I just needed to say that and not gloss it over as though I wasn't one of the people saying, how about who? What do you mean? Because that's what I said. I said, I, this is very sad and very unfortunate because I don't understand what this person means. And you know, there's so much love and respect between Ati and myself. And there's so much love and respect for a lot of us, even when we disagree with one another. I don't do cancel culture. I really don't think that human beings should be canceled. I think that we can have conversations with one another. It's just some people are fucking. <laughs> and that is the truth of it. And we decide whether we engage or we don't engage. And how it's happening now, it's happening in the social media space. It happened in clicks in our lives before. Now it's happening in this particular way that it is happening, but it stops us from actually having real conversations with one another. And for me, that's the only sad thing about it. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I'm not sure if uh, you'd like to respond, Ati, before I get back to Tishue, but I think um, uh, I really appreciate the fact that uh, you're owning to um, how, I'm talking to you now, Bev, um, you're owning to how you, um, what your gut response was that, you know, was online, if anyone wants to, to check it out, although I do not encourage people to um, feel um, uh, that kind of energy. Um, this is a productive space for us to have this conversation. Um, I think it is important for people to understand why the queer community was so upset about the response that Ati made. Of course, Ati has just responded why they, they did, because, you know, what is she supposed to say? Like out people and go and give a registry of who exactly was queer in her cast, in her crew. You know, she doesn't necessarily owe us that. But the truth of the matter is so many people have had a lower glass ceiling as a result of their homosexuality. Um, I was talking about the, the film While You Weren't Looking earlier, which was a film that produced by the Out in Africa Film Festival. And that was the film, fest the Out in Africa Film Festival is the, uh, the oldest um, gay and lesbian film festival in the country. And it had been running for 20 years. And in its final year, instead of doing another film festival for the queer community, they decided to spend the money that they would have spent on the film festival um, to rather produce a film. And the intention behind producing that film was to empower queer filmmakers. So in my involvement with the film, we, uh, in the application for the funding, we made it very clear that this was a film where we would cast uh, queer crew members that had always stayed as assistants, as interns, as people that were never 
deemed worthy of being HODs. So I'm hoping that this can be context for um, uh, a generation that, under that doesn't understand where we come from as queer people. There has been years and years, generations and generations on of homophobia in micromanagement uh, ways where queer people have been kept in their place and not been allowed to shine, not because they're not educated, not because they had a uh, uh, lack of access to opportunities, but because those micromanagement systems are pervasive and they are allowed where people are kept in their space. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm going all over the place, but I hope you understand that it is not for a lack of, um, of qualified queer individuals in this industry. Those people have been kept in a place systematically. Um, so when people were responding the way that they did online to say, oh, how could you say I'm not great? Do you know what I've done in my life to try and get myself seen? The walls just keep crashing down on me. Um, I'm not sure if Jabu, you can speak to this about just the statistics that are out there of uh, queer people in this country worldwide, um, what that means to queer people for not getting access to opportunities that are rightfully theirs. Thank you. Um... Yeah, Tishwe is back. I wonder if we can pause and rather go there and then come back. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Hi, Tish. We were just talking about um, the, the, I'm not sure if you heard us or not, but uh, we wanted to invite you on screen with us to, to talk about you as a qualified professional actress who is not just an actress. Actor. But so uh, somebody who's a storyliner, a scriptwriter, working in these rooms uh, with us. Um, please speak to, to that for us, as we all feel like there aren't enough queer people to represent us in these spaces. Um, yes, um, thank you, Mahano, for creating the space. Um, uh, first of all, I must say I, I do not identify as an actress. I'm an actor. Uh, so okay. let me just... Uh, uh, it's in Lungi Selab. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the space is so problematic. Um, the acting space, the casting space is so problematic because we are always required to identify within um, the binary gender before we can do the work. Um, so I must first identify as an actress or an actor before I can do the work. And I have no reference of anyone who's done this before me in this country. Um, everything for, for me, for the work that I am doing as an actor has always been within binary culture that I don't subscribe to. Um, so it is incredibly uh, difficult. And I am grateful that I'm a director. I'm grateful that um, uh, I am a storyteller first because I, I'm writing stories and there, there are so many things that I agree with, with people that um, I, might, I might be canceled for, um, but I agree on, on, on many levels because as an artist and as a, an actor and as a filmmaker, all those things have to happen with me all at the same time. So when Ati goes on a panel and says that um, she will cast the best actor before she will cast a queer person, I, I went home and I, I did my own questioning because I asked myself what my truth is um, as a director, as an artist. Um, I... I believe and strongly uphold um, the work, um, but also I am vexed. Uh, I am vexed as someone who is queer born. So uh, for example, unlike um, individuals like uh, Dr. Bev Dizzy, who I love and respect so much, I haven't given my life to activism. I've given my life to art and 
I'm always looking for the best person for the role. So it's a conflict for me then. I have to ask myself those questions all the time of who will I cast now, me as a director, who will I cast in the role? Will I cast the best actor or will I cast a queer for the sake of representation? And that's a question that I am dealing with. And I'm openly, I'm openly stating that that's something that I'm dealing with. But I'm also very aware of the fact that I cannot be ignorant. I cannot be ignorant of the politics because I live as a queer person. I've also been, I have lost so many roles because I don't have breasts, because I, uh, I look gay. So I will be the last person to not cast a queer person in a role. However, I am I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not even questioning. Questioning is a problematic sentiment in itself. I am I'm trying to find out what is going on in the world around me. That's what I'm doing. I'm not questioning. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And as a, a queer director that must cast actors, um, my, the projects I'm working on right now um, as a director, I have um, six leads, ne? Um, and they're prominent leads. Obviously there are two main mains, and then, but there are six main leads. There are only two straight people in that film because I have no idea how to, talk about straightness. And so when I wrote, I wrote about the world from a queer perspective, but that's because I am a queer writer. I am a queer director. So you will only hear queer truth from my pen. So now maybe the question we should be asking is, should straight creatives be writing queer narratives because me i couldn't i couldn't when i write um a narrative it will always have a queer perspective it will always have a queer perspective because i'm queer and we need more of those so maybe we should stop asking straight people to tell queer stories correctly they can't they won't they are always wrong they are always wrong I wake up angry every morning because I'm on Twitter. I even want to cancel Twitter because straight people that I respect, that I love, misrepresent me as a queer person. Every time they type, every time they interview people, I am just like, oh my God, now I have to cancel a friendship because you have just offended me in the worst way by doing your job. You as a straight person can never speak about queerness. You can't. It's something I feel so strongly about. And I don't understand why straight people think they need to speak about queerness. That is my problem. That is my problem as a being. That is my problem as a storyteller. And for some reason, straight people feel like they have a right to the queer narrative. They will never get it right. And they have no right to tell it. The same way that we say that white people cannot talk about black identity. Straight people cannot talk about queer identity. That is a fact. And that is something that I rest on. And I get, if I get cancelled, go to it. <laughs> I enjoy okay. And also, one more thing, one more thing, Makano, before I go. Um, what I must admonish queer people about is that they have decided who's queer and who is not. People haven't come out. You don't know who's queer and who isn't. So when people take on roles and then they star in those films, and then you as a queer person say, oh no, Usif uh, uh, is not allowed to take on a role of this thing 
or Uzbani is not allowed to take on a role? Why must they come out to you first? So us as queers, why do we need these people to uh, come out to us? Me, I, no one came out to me uh, in, that, in the creative space. I don't need Uzola to come out to me for me to qualify her as the lead actor in Trapped. I don't need Siv to come out to me for him, they, whatever, to qualify for the space that he, is, they, is owning. Also because he... Tish, because your network is a little oh. low. Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to, because what you've just said are very, very powerful words. And I think, um, I, I hope we get to play this over and over again, because literally everybody on this panel has, has been dropping truth bombs. Um, and I'm glad we're having this conversation. But there is um, uh, two things that you um we cannot have straight people telling queer stories. And my question to you is what of the allies? What of the allies that have not proved to be problematic? I am on the opposite spectrum of you in my opinion that I feel it's important for us to have queer storylines in every story, in every movie, because I live in a world where there are queer people in our lives, right? Uh, I feel uncomfortable watching a show that is just straight people in yeah, the same okay. way that I feel uncomfortable watching a show where they are just white people. That's not the world that I live in. And when I tune in on my TV, when I choose a movie, I am choosing a movie that represents me, right? So I, so coming to the, the next point that you're saying is it's not que queer people don't have shouldn't be held responsible to come out before they can then be deemed worthy to tell queer stories. So if I'm now in a story room with somebody and they are suggesting that, you know, in tomorrow's episode, I think I'd like to have uh, character X uh, do one, two, three. Now, must that person then give me their queer credentials for me to even hear them out? I think that's personally problematic to now essentially ask for a queer registry of who is allowed to tell what story. Isn't there a middle ground where we can uh, acknowledge that allies are important and have teachable moments for those allies to say, if you're going to talk about me, talk about me in this way, one, two, three, don't talk about me in this way, that is problematic. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm literally opening this out to all four of you to say, what do we do now that we are stuck in this place? What do we do one about Stella? There's I, one thing you said. Okay, one maybe I should. should sorry. One yeah, thing yeah. you said, nothing about us without us. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Ngabonga to hotel. Um, I am still learning on the subject of allyship, so I do not speak about it. Ngoba yang limaz me personally and uh before i can speak on platforms i must acknowledge that i'm human first and as a human as a queer person i have been hurt by people that hold up allyship so i i no longer on platforms speak about allies i will only speak about myself and my queerness and uh on behalf of the queerness that i uphold that i know that i can speak on behalf of but uh, I can never speak about allies. Uh, I'm an ally, so uh, I have nothing to say about that. Uh, please make a room for that and then tell me how it went. <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. Babe, you were gonna say? I said everything that I needed to say. I think oh, power yeah. and positionality, to be honest with you, power and positionality almost demands that the, those who are in positions of power continue to dictate the terms of engagement continuously. Yes. Whether it and is only, men, whether it is powerful. white people, whether it is exactly, everybody else dictates the terms. Instead, we don't dictate as a black 
gender non-conforming woman from an underserviced community in my whole life. I'm almost 50 years old. There's always somebody else who seems to think that they are so much more superior to me and my voice that they determine those terms. And if you think about it, if there are all these allies in positions of power who then determine that, no, because I'm an ally, anybody can claim allyship in order to be able to do the things that they know very well that because they're in the positions of power that they can then execute much easier than I would be able to. I've been in TV since I was nine years old. I've been in television since television was three years old in South Africa. Do you understand? I have mm. done television since I was a baby in this space. I have directed so many reality shows and so many different shows, but you know why nobody knows? because I am not presentable, palatable, because I am not straight looking, because yes. I'm not in a wheel, because I am not that person that's going to go out there and claim all of these things. And yet, if you really look at it, I've been doing this for 30 years in this space, doing my best to push and represent, doing my very best. And yet it will always be the allies who will get the positions. Mm. It will always be somebody else who has the position of power to determine whether I get the role or not, whether I get the job or not. Even when I apply for it, I'm not gonna get it because it will always be somebody else who has the position of power to make that determination. So no, I'm, I'm for me, nothing about us without us. If we are not in the room, if we are not in the space to make sure that you are literally fully representing me, why the hell are you talking about me? Wow, that is very powerful. I, I definitely hear you. I, I'd like to ask Jabu, as somebody that works in, um, in the political space, you work to make sure that our legislation has been changed and often find yourself working with people that, that call themselves how do you navigate this um, to make the world a better place for us? Um, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Wow. Um, sure. There's so much happening in the space. It's really exciting. Um, I, I, I think there are a couple of things that I just want to quickly respond to. I think allyship. Allyship is when you identify that that person is an ally, then that person is an ally. An ally can't identify themselves as an ally. So I just want to be clear that when people say I'm an ally, no, you're not. You are only an ally when I say you're an ally or when another queer person embraces you and identifies you an ally. You can't self-appoint yourself as an ally. Um, and so I just want to say that I think the other issue, just I, I want to throw this out to the group uh, running uh, an NGO on media and queer media and so on, is that even when we do try and bring in um, queer directors, uh, film producers, etc., cetera, um, there's also a struggle around um, consciousness of queer content. Um, being queer doesn't mean that you understand queer lives and queer experiences in a way that is completely understood. I, I, I think um, this, this and, and I think there's good uh, synergy in how we can uh, build uh, better relationships um, between um, um, you know, creatives and activists, because I think both are, act are spaces of activism. So I just want to say to uh, Tishua is that you are an activist in your very space. You are exactly embodying that in the way of changing the whole messed up patriarchal way of mainstream cinema, mainstream television. And the fact that we have to constantly fight and struggle for space is completely messed up. Um, and I think just from an NGO perspective, you know, we don't have the budgets of the NFVF and, and so on. And often it's very difficult for us to, to come in and say, come and collaborate with us um, because I know film making in itself is expensive. And I'm just wondering, I know that's a separate question, but how do we try and bring greater synergy between queer creatives and activists and in, 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 in finding collaborative ways of, of engaging? Because I think that's that's very, very important. Um, and, and, I, and I do think we have to find a way of monitoring and stopping the fetishization of bodies. Um, I've just seen an email now that UNFPA wants to run a video campaign on, on menstruation and now wants to 
invite trans men into such a film. That is offensive media fetishization of bodies, of bodily practice. And I'm just saying that yet so, so that we can say we need to talk about the issues. We have international cinema people coming here wanting to document black lives around uh, violence, around hate crimes. Um, we want to tell the African story, the old colonialist model of, 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 of extraction of story. And so there are a lot of things that I think we're competing against. And so how do we claim a, a queer space of, of creativity, of, of, of authenticity that belongs to us in that way? Thanks. Wow. Uh, I mean, here we are just trying to make sure that we have queer representatives, uh, representation in the media, but really on a global, global level, there's so many problematic things that are, are happening. And I, I mean, I totally hear you, Tishu, and I, I say this as somebody that has, has been in these story rooms with you, trying to be intentional with what we are putting out there in the media. Um, I, I am a firm believer that I, I'm here to fix my tribe. My tribe is the black tribe, the female tribe, the queer tribe. Everybody else can, um, uh, you know, pull together their resources to to fix their tribes as well, um, because it's so much. Um, I I wonder how we can how we can all pool our resources to make sure that if I'm now trying to make sure that I am, you know making sure that there is a trans character, let's say, in a series. Um, how do I make sure that that is not problematic? If I'm trying to represent a gender non-binary character in a series, how do I make sure that that is not problematic? As Jabu has just um, uh, used that, that video as an example, like, you know, th that term queer baiting, I really like that term queer correct me if I'm wrong because I'm always the best at describing new terminology but to my understanding queer baiting is adding queer characters in you know in media uh, for this for the pure pleasure of ticking the box of saying you know hey we have represented this community blah 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 but without a full understanding of what that life experience is and therefore it ends up having us having these kind of conversations where we like, this is triggering, it is done wrong. Um, how do we fix queer baiting moving forward? Can I speak to that? Yes, please. Um, I, I will um, go back to the fact that um, only a queer writer um, can, can write that narrative. Um, because I, I have found my first film, my first short film, I was in a, a very deep and intense questioning stages of my own queerness. Um, there were things about queerness, me as a queer personality did not understand. However, I made a queer film and it was my first film because that's, that's what I needed to say and that's what I had to say. Um, and in my growing as, as a person, um, it, 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 took, it took me growing to only today. And there are things I still don't understand, but only today I feel I, I, I am a valid voice for, for queer voices. So if it's taken me as a queer person 10 years to qualify to tell a queer story. How can a straight person tell my story? So we go back to storytelling now. Um, if we are saying that we are telling stories and we're starting there, storytelling, um, let's not queer bait them. Let's tell um, a narrative of a world that is true. And what heterosexual people and cis identifying people don't understand is that the world is not cis. They literally live like in blindness, thinking that the entire world is heterosexual. 
And the reason why, for me personally, I, I, I come onto these spaces, I exist in these spaces, is because I want to tell you, um, heterosexual cis filmmaker, is that the world is not cis. You're not aware of the fact that so much of the world is queer. So if a, um, a cis person can be intelligent enough to understand that the world is not cis, then please go ahead and tell your story. Cost who you cost, but be intelligent enough to understand that the world is not cis. That's my thing. And I think where the argument gets um, difficult between us as queer people and cis people is that um, they're not understanding that the world is not heterosexual. They've accepted, they've accepted that the world is heterosexual. So that's what we need to fix. And maybe if we fix that, uh, me, I have a lot of question marks. Uh, um, I don't know a lot of um, straight people, <laughs> but perhaps if I got into some conversations with them, they might be able to tell queer stories if they understood that the world is queer. The world is so queer. I know more queer people than I do straight people. I, I probably know one person who is not. So can you please investigate that, you straight person? I feel like they need to go and investigate the world. That's my thing about this conversation is that straight people, cis people have not been given room or are not giving themselves room to understand that the world is not like that. And so they tell stories that are so finite, that are so finite that they leave out who and where we all are. And then you can have a license to tell your story as a straight person about other types of people. Because also I, I myself as a queer person, my first feature is having a straight person because I need to interrogate straightness. So I cast a straight person because I'm interrogating straightness. So mine is a bit more intelligent than a straight person will do. And I'm not being arrogant about it, but maybe I am. And that's okay. Um, but I am using that as I'm a really glad that you brought I'm really glad that you brought in the, the, the casting because that's really where we, uh, that's what brought us all to this table. Like mm. the issue of now, what do we do about casting? Because like, like we have said in this room, um, the issue of storytelling is an issue of curiosity and intelligence, right? Um, if you don't have the emotional intelligence uh, to see a story all the way through, please leave it alone. Call somebody who is knowledgeable in that division to help you um, tell that story. Um, you know, just to sidetrack a little bit, when we did Society, Society for Young People is a, is a show that I wrote and produced in 2006. It was on screen 2007. And I can actually say I was straight at the time. Right. It was a mini series about four girls navigating, four black girls navigating society's expectations on the black, for on black women. Right. Um, so multiple storylines. Uh, one of the characters uh, we want, like any other show, you know, there's a comic relief, there's wah, 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 but there's also going to be the romantic storyline. And in that romantic storyline, we thought, oh, well, this is a show about women. Um, and if we're going to have a romantic storyline, of course, it's going to be a uh, same sex uh, storyline. So therefore, it became a, a lesbian storyline. Um, because at the time, I was living in a very cis, straight world, 
I knew, talking about just emotional intelligence, I knew that I didn't have the authority to tell that kind of story. Myself and Lodi, who was my business partner at the time, we wrote and produced the story at the time. We knew at the time that we did not have the arsenal available to us to tell the story in a way that could even be beyond our first thought. So what I'm proposing to anybody that is out there that could be wanting to tell this um, uh more nuanced storytelling in their in their shows is do what I'm suggesting, do what we did, where we literally had a focus group. Find the people in real life that represent the characters that you have dreamt up. Um, it was at a cost to ourselves. I understand that that is not a luxury that everybody has, but for our own integrity, that is what we decided to do. We invited lesbians to the group. It was quite a challenge trying to, to find people that we didn't know. So we called friends like, hey, hope I'm not being offensive. Do you have a lesbian friend who would be willing to sit in a focus group with me to listen to my story? And we literally had a script reading of four episodes of the series to say, hey, this is what we've written. Please let us know if you think this is problematic and what else could we add to the story that would make it um, a richer experience for you as an audience member. I have since learned that that was a saving grace of my career. That was the first show I'd ever produced and written ever. Um, and it is now how I choose to work when I am working in a space that I don't know. I've since become queer. I've since understood myself to be a queer person. Of course, I was intrigued um, on a deeper level and that's why I created that kind of character. But I think there is a way for us to tell stories that we don't fully understand. And I'm literally using society as an example for how it is possible. When it comes to casting now, as you, as, as you had mentioned, now we are in this conundrum. We have given ourselves the permission to write these stories. We have the authority to write these stories, um, but now they need to be performed by somebody. And like we've already established, being out is a matter of safety. Um, and, you know, I'm uh, just for the record, I am reading everybody's comments uh, in the comment section on the side and um, I'm making sure that we are filtering in your comments in our discussion here. And, you know, people do concur that we don't have that registry of queer actors and we are also not trying to out people because that is a matter of safety. So now, like you've said, Tishiwe, you've got this feature film. I'm not sure if it's a feature film or a series. You've got this feature film that you are inclined to cast a straight person and you're giving yourself the permission to cast that straight person because you feel you have got the authority as the director to direct them in a way that wouldn't be problematic. What do we then do to avoid uh, no. getting you in a situation where that he was? Okay, let Where me then that. she was um, cyberbullied online because people want queer credential. Mm -hmm. The the lead um the lead role is straight. So can be played by either a queer or a straight mm -hmm. person. Uh, so me as a queer actor, I've played straight act uh, straight characters. I've never been asked before, are you straight? Oh, you won't be able to play this because you are not straight. So I have the emotional intelligence as an actor to play a straight person, even though I'm queer. I use that intelligence in my craft. Um, I just want to correct there. I'm saying that in my cast of six, four of them are queer, two of them are straight. The two straight people uh, might possibly be straight actors. They already cast. But I haven't asked them whether they are queer or they are straight because it's no business of mine. They are cast because they're brilliant actors and they're already cast and they're going to do the job and we are already in script workshopping with them. So I'm with them because in their role as straight characters, they're going to do a great job. And then in the role of the four queer people, that were written because I know that my world is more queer than it is straight. 
That is why the world of this story is more queer than it is straight. I have cast queer actors because I know them. And it is unfortunate that there are um, queer actors in the world that do not find work and get agitated every time they hear that there is a straight person that has gotten a job of a queer role. And so I then, I wonder what I must do as a, a, a queer filmmaker actor in, in, in those types of situations, because I know I'm doing my job. I'm doing my job. I, I will never cast straight actors all the time. I will cast great actors all the time. As a director, that's what I do. And I happen to um, cast, um, I cast out of, out of knowledge. I cast out of, oh my God, this person knows this truth. So that's how I cast. It's never, is this person gay or not? It just so happens that everyone around me is gay. <laughs> so it makes that question that I find on Twitter very um, challenging for me to be part of because I'm never casting people because they're not queer. So for me, I, I know maybe Nizong Kansel but I um, I I do the work. Um, I cast the right, the right soul. That is what I will always do. So sometimes I feel like it's very hard for me to engage in these conversations because I don't know if I have enough to say about casting um, in these spaces because I'm not casting as an agent. I'm casting as who do I know is right for this role? And that's how you I know, It's unfortunate that um, uh, that uh, Wesley wasn't able to join this conversation. Wesley is a uh, is, um, casting agent and sometimes a casting director. And um, I feel like I can speak a little bit to uh, mm. what uh, Wesley was going to share to this room. Um, but what, when I had the conversation asking Wesley to join us on, uh, on this webinar, it was to say as an agent, as a casting director, what is the responsibility? You know, the industry is not just writers, directors and producers. We, as those people, don't know all the actors that are out there in this country. Mm -hmm. So myself as an actor, I have an agent. I have made it my business to let my agent know that I am queer so that they know the full spectrum of the kind of roles that I could play, um, but also just my personal politics um, uh, for them to you know, intuitively, intuitively uh, know where to cast me. So I don't know how we can, um, we can broaden this conversation to make sure that we are not the only people held accountable and responsible for us changing this industry. I'm a firm believer that casting directors need to have a more intimate relationship with the cast, with the actors that are out there in this country, and that um, agents need to create a safe space for their character, for their actors, um, for them to know that if these roles do come out, please pick me. So many people in the comments um, uh, here on YouTube and on Facebook are saying, hey, you know, I, I was in drama school. I wasn't allowed to, um, I was told that I would never be an actor because I am not cisgender and I don't want to play wear dresses or, you know, I had to have somebody else try and make sure that I'm in this role uh, because no one was trying to hear me out. How do we make sure that this is not something that we are carrying as a burden by ourselves? Um, do you guys have any suggestions for how this can be done? So, so I think just to put a stamp on what you said, Mahalo, and what um, Tishiwe said, that literally when i said earlier on that my politics are clear i want to tell a happy queer story and that's what i'm doing so the responsibility now of of, of the representation it's important but at the time i think my biggest responsibility is to represent queerness beautifully on screen 
So I, I like what you were saying when you were saying maybe casting directors should also come on board so that we'll all work as a chain to go, okay, here's my responsibility. Here's the work I'm doing in this space. So everybody has their little parts to do because at the end of the day, it is going to be really hard to, to correctly tick all these boxes and you are going to drop, drop the ball sometimes when your role and, and the work that you need to do is here. You know, so I think I think for me, what you said is quite important that let's all work as a chain, have casting directors form intimate relationships with the people that need to represent the stories, which are actors. Um, may I, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a really clear drive to nurture us if you already have slates that exist that are focused on the youth you have slates that are clearly focused on developing women and uh, uh, female filmmakers and i say it that way because that is how it is being used where are we why are we all as individuals fighting our own battles in our own corners fighting for space you know, because it, it means absolutely everything to find yourself in a room, whether it is a production space or a, a, a crew space. And I look around and all my people, or at least 90% of my people are queer. Um, it's, I've only ever been in one production where I was series director. And you could even tell in the content that came out because my entire research team, my entire production team, except for maybe one or two people, were all queer. And what ended up happening is that on TV, there were so many more queer characters, just simply because this is how we all identified and this is how we were seeing the world that we live in, to a point where even the producers started actually questioning, what are we doing? Why are we pushing this queer agenda? Like, no, we're not pushing any agenda we are living our lives and we are seeing ourselves on our screens as full-bodied human beings. It means so much. Almost all work that I do, I look around and I try. I've, like many of the documentaries that I make, I would have a woman on camera and I would have a woman on sound and I would, you try. And unfortunately, I would have to admit even to everybody as much as I don't want to admit it, when somebody is not good, they're gonna mess up my name and my work. And so a lot of the time I find myself True. working with like cishead brothers, as long as we have a deep understanding of the work that we're doing and a lot of the time they do. And until I find, and, I, and normally I do, and when I do find somebody who is really amazing, whether as an editor or as a DOP or as a soundie or as a, it doesn't matter what the role that they do on the job, if they're really good and passionate about what they're doing, oh my, my goodness, please, you're welcome, let's work. And I put it out, I do a lot of call outs like that. But we're not nurturing amongst ourselves as much as we could but we're also not getting the level of support that we need in order to be able to do so. I know that Jabu and Iranti nurture and actually do a lot of training. And I have pledged to work with, with some of the people who have come through Iranti. And, but you know, Iranti is one small NGO where the rest of the national structures that continue to put money into different slates, we are not developing ourselves as we could. And I know people keep saying things like, yeah, but Bev, you are in a position to be able to take on trainees. Do you know something as an independent filmmaker, I'm struggling to even put bread on my own table for my, for my family. And now I'm picking up someone and in, in, in saying, oh, I can't pay you because I'm training you. That does not work. We, we cannot and we should not be doing that. No matter how many people come to me and say, train me, it's for free. That for me feels exploitative. We need to be able to have structures that support us for us to be able to do that. And yes, this is NFVF. You are the national structure. Yes, NFVF as a national structure. I'm pointing. I'm very thankful that this is happening because we need this in order for us to be able to at least cross over a little bit of the bridge. Um, can I just quickly, you know, I know that I'm talking on, but Jabu actually 
brought up something really important about effective representation. And I think that's what we kind of call it um, in my own home and amongst my own people is representation can be a misrepresentation. And just because we have so many queer people that are entering the space, they can do a lot more harm than they do positive just simply because of how we are being misrepresented because just simply because already the agenda you are fulfilling, it may not necessarily be for us, for our well-being, for our mental well-being, for our physical, it could just very easily be while it is for yourself, it could very easily be fulfilling the agenda of those who are intending to harm us. And so the problem here is that we end up being police. We end up now having to police people's expression. And for me, I never want to be there policing people's uh, um, expression. And I don't think that that's what we want to do. But at the same time, people need to be cognizant of the fact that if you do not have the language and you don't know how to explain things that things make sense, then why are you there? Because ultimately we already have a society that already has all these misconceptions about who we are and they're running with it. They're running with the misconceptions about who we are. And so if you don't have people who know how to actually say, no, that's not who we are, then we are in the same space where we continue to endanger ourselves. And once again, organizations like OUT, organizations like Iranti exist for exactly those purposes. There are people who know how to do this work. That's why we are here. So we do have a lot of work to do. I'm so glad you brought that up um, because yes, as, as grateful as I am that uh, the NFVF have um, uh, agreed and volunteered to host us here. Um, I actually was wondering, do I have the right to make a plea to the NFVF Exactly like you're saying, Bev, to say in the same way that there is a film slate for uh, women, mm. there's a film slate for uh, Black people. Why can we not yes. have a slate for queer yes, people? Queer and I people. honestly believe that that might be the solution that we need, because suddenly we will no longer have the excuse that they aren't enough queer actors, that they aren't enough queer crew members. We will be able to see have the world see what queer people are able to do. We tried to do that in our own little way in that movie while you weren't looking. It was one movie that really did fantastically well. But even in that, we weren't able to have a pure queer cast um, for all the reasons that we have been expressing on, um, on this panel. Um, my personal dream. I'm hoping that that can be the outcome of this webinar. And I do acknowledge that slates are a very expensive thing. This is my plea to not just the NFVF, but to corporate South Africa, to everybody that is there um, with their corporate sponsorship for all the prides that exist in this country. Please put your money where your mouth is at. And if you really do believe that representation matters, really put your money where your mouth is at and make sure that these films that we're all talking about on this panel do finally get to see the light of day. Luckily for us, we have now stepped into a digital world where we are not just reliant on the national broadcaster to show our films. We have, you know, online platforms, queer specific curated online platforms that have a dedicated audience for us to have uh, uh, an audience that loves our shows. Um, I can say this for sure. Like when we did Society, it then was, you know, the queer community worldwide asked for it to be turned into a feature film for just Beth's character, who was a lesbian character. That feature film that was extracted from the series, that feature film traveled the film festivals around the world for two whole years two whole years, like the, the, the few film festivals that I was able to attend, like London, like Brazil, like Amsterdam, packed houses, like they aren't enough films for black queer stories in this world. So we will be making so much money for an industry that already is lacking in stories. So this is me standing on a Apple box, Apple box, that's a film term, on my soapbox saying NFVF, 
all the national bodies that exist, but also corporate South Africa, please come to the party and, and really fund these films because you are missing out on a, a lion's share of revenue that, um, that could make us a, a better person. I really want to ask Jabu, how do you do it? I mean, the work that we're doing here, like Bev was saying, like Jabu was saying earlier, in our own little ways, we are being activists in us just putting ourselves out there to say, hey, please count us in. How do you make sure that you are advocating for queer rights every day and still maintaining your mental health and so that the world is a better place because it is exhausting for us to do the work that we do? Right now, there's an online attack on my being and my life and um, for the work that I'm doing <laughs> and um, the organization. I don't know if people have seen the, the attacks on, on jo from Joburg Pride and from individuals. So I think the violence uh, and the, my colleague today said an interesting word. Um, she said keyboard activists. I think the, the, there's, um, there's a way in which um, the internet is used for voice and I think it's a very important space and I think one it's not it's it's, it's a very valid space um, I, I think that queer bodies are traumatized bodies queer black bodies are traumatized bodies no matter where you are whether you um, in cinema or <laughs> wherever you are it's a traumatized space and we are speaking about that very trauma here. And I think the way we permeate that trauma, be it from me or be it from somebody else, uh, um, is inherent in, in, in how we are responsive to violence. So violence internally and then violence from the context and the environment. I think all of these kind of things um, become absolutely fundamental to how we think about restorative ways of, of healing. Um, I, I do think that um, this example of like the, the naming and shaming and the, the call out culture of, of the internet and so on, I think all these spaces are valid, but I think um, it's equally important to have mutual accountability in how we do that. Um, and, and if our, our, our collective intention is healing and if our collective intention is solidarity, then I think we need to find ways that, that speaks to that. Um, because I don't think there's anybody here that can say I was born in a space of joy as a black queer person. Um, I think we have all um, continue even to, uh, whether it's a trauma that you're experiencing or whether it's the news that you're reading that another queer person was killed as we are seeing in these past weeks, um, unprecedented uh, numbers of queer persons that are just being murdered in this country um, and those who are surviving attacks. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's it, you know, the violence permeates violence. And so um, mental well-being to me is an eternal, it's an, it's an eternal practice. It's not, um, um, you know, trauma is created and, and I think trauma can also be healed. Um, but I think it's 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 exactly starts in the kind of spaces that we are are, are relaying now, the kind of the kind of conversations that we are having, um, the sharing of our vulnerabilities. Um, there's power in that. Um, too often, queer bodies have been shamed on cinema. Um, you can't come out because it will threaten your economic well-being. All of those things we've seen it now with the pandemic. Like queer artists are highly are affected. Um, in their well-being, in their livelihood, um, where's the solidarity in 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 that? We we it's enough that we speak about it. No, um, we need to come to the party uh, with with far more than 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 conversations. And I think the kind of recommendations that you're making to the NAVF is one active way of saying we need to own a space within mainstream media and we need to claim that space. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. It's so um, sobering to have that context. Um, there are lots of people in the comments um, on the side saying, oh, well, I didn't know that, you know, coming out is an unsafe thing. Yes, it is. And, you know, the joy of activism, if, you know, despite the oxymoron of that statement, the joy of activism is that it allows people to have a safer world in the future. So I... 
I will never stop saying thank you to the work that you do, Jabi, the work that you do, Bev, to make sure that we are even at this point in our lives to have this conversation about um, queer representation in the media, because there was a time when this wasn't even an issue. This wasn't even up for grabs. I was saying to Bev, um, as I was inviting, I was inviting him to be on this panel that when we did society, we were told that, oh, there's too much queerness on screen. At most, you can only have two kisses and a hug. That's like too much for audiences to deal with. So we had to cut out all the intimate scenes, which I knew the queer community was craving. But because we had not progressed as a society, according to the broadcaster, all we were allowed at the time was two kisses and a hug. That's where we come from. We are now at a place where we can complain that Ingeva is on screen, that we can complain about the way Morphe was portrayed, that we can have an issue with how Ati um, cast her film. But we shouldn't forget that we come from a place where we were not even at the table to have this discussion. So I and the kind of person that um, I'm not a, yes, I, you know, I complain because when I saw Ling Latarin, but I do think it's important to have solutions. So as we round up, because, you know, we've been having this conversation for almost two hours, uh, it's almost five o'clock. Um, I would like to invite um, everybody on this panel to, uh, to give us a sense of hope because in the audience today, this is not, you know, this conversation that we're having right now could be a conversation that, you know, we could be having at my dinner table because we all know each other. We've been doing this work for years, but the point of this conversation is for the audience. They are young people that have no idea of how far we've come. And I believe it is important for us to hand on that baton to them to say as millennials, as Gen Zs, as Gen Xs, all of these things that you are, how can we hand over the baton to you for you to create a better world? Um, because it is possible. So if there's any hope in you, Bev, what would you say? I think wrong timing, Mahan. And, and I'm only saying that because I have to be truthful. That's true. And the truth is the last month, without me even realizing what was going on, the PTSD came back so hard, it undid 10 years of therapy that I did in my 20s just to survive. Because being the only, for many, many years, being the only out very visible lesbian in my own space, in, in my country, being persona non grata in at least three other countries, being chased, being attacked, meant that I had to figure out a way to physically but more emotionally and psychologically to live. And here I was, all of that undone by the level of hatred on social media that is not only unwarranted, but it, it borders on hate speech, if not outright hate speech, to a point where, where you think, okay, I can't even be on social media anymore because every single time I'm either seeing the people be calling us, it, and they, and them, and these alphabet people, and the this, and the that, and then almost immediately, somebody's just been killed. Where you know for sure that all of these are a call to action. How do, how do genocides happen? First, you dehumanize the people you want to kill. You make them a they, you make them the, the, this, you call them other. names. They are othered and they are dehumanized. Because once they are dehumanized, everybody agrees. Even if it might not be consciously, it might not be verbally, but everybody agrees that our lives are not worthy. We are not worthy. And to live this entire life and get to a point where you realize that, why does it feel like we're working backwards? And I'm speaking purely for myself because you asked me about hope. I fight for hope. My every day is about fighting for the hope because it sometimes feels like the hope is dwindling. So my therapist suggests things like get off social media. 
It does not remove the reality of the fact that we are being brutalized out there. But I also physically, I need to do something. So you know what, we work within the law. We try to see, okay, so how are we making this law that I and Jabu and many of us personally fought for, literally with our bodies? How do we make sure that we are able to actually implement these laws? How do people sitting on Twitter not know and understand that when you say the things that you say, in actual fact, there is a law that says that you can't do that. And then they say it's an opinion. That's not an opinion. It is a call to action. How do we hold people accountable who are actually making a call to action for me, you, you, and you, and you to die? And so my every day is just, okay, um, we're talking mental health. Many of us are in therapy. Many of us use anti-anxieties and antidepressants just so that we can live, just so that we are able to function on a daily basis while we are holding on to hope. One thing that really, and I'm, I'm gonna say this no matter how many times, and like Tishiwa said, you can cancel me if you want. The work that we did, Libo Jabu, in the early 90s of going out and educating, the work that we continue to do different organizations, different individuals, whether you're talking Triangle in Cape Town or you're talking out, going out to Mpumalanga or Tami Dish Foundation, no matter how much we feel or what we feel, the reason we go out there to educate is so that we are not at this place where people think that they know who we are and they can talk to us and talk about us the way that they think that they are okay to do. We were educating to make sure that people actually understood and see us as human beings. And then that stopped. And now you have all the young people saying things like, what do you mean I must educate? Honey, here's my question. Who do you think is going to do the educating? The same people who don't give a fuck about you? Are those the people that are supposed to educate themselves? That's not going to happen. You know it and I know it. So if we call ourselves activists and our activism is sitting at a keyboard insulting people, how are we actually advancing anything? How are we moving forward? Right now, there's such animosity and hatred between us where we go, yeah, the cis heads, the cis heads, the cis heads, and they're going, like Dabani Mez, this alphabet gang. They're not the ones that are getting killed. We are. We, all of us need to do something to change this because my biggest worry is that this is starting to infiltrate into the same storylines that we are fighting. Because now there's a, almost a tacit understanding that these gay people want to murder uh, others. These gay people don't care. These gay people, already that's now what's happening and it's beginning to infiltrate into the narratives. We need to stop this. We need to stop this. I am feeling a little bit hopeless. And I did say that's because I am in the space now where I'm dealing with my own issues. So I apologize. There is hope. There is, whenever I see young queer people being themselves, whenever I drive go high politicianing, and these are like really visible, and they're like a young couple, and they have like fancy like, rainbow colors, and they can suit. I smile because there was a time when I was the only one I knew at the age of fourteen. Yo, I smile. Yo. It's so everything that you've said, like really has just touched me in such a deep place, like all over again, like you being triggered has just triggered me all over again. I, I am lucky enough. I'm just that generation below you um, that had enjoyed the freedoms that you afford, afforded me with the atrocities that have happened to you by fighting for my rights with your body. So I will never stop saying thank you to you. Um, I applaud the both of you for, because I, I do believe that um, you only fight because you have hope. So in everything that you've said, uh, by expressing all the things that trigger you, that is the reason why we need to have hope. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that Ati has had to um, leave early because they had um, other um, engagements and this conversation, like I said, has gone for a while. And I think Tish is in and out uh, with their network. But 
I'm now talking to the generation that is uh, younger than me. And rightfully so, as you've said, when we walk out and we see people that are living their lives out and proudly, it is such a wonderful affirmation. Um, when Ati, in her response at the Q&A uh, to her film, she one of the things that weren't then published that didn't go viral was her reminding us that it is important for her to show a world where queer people are happy. And this is a sentiment that I have heard over and over and over again from young people who are like, yeah, they, you know, the societies of this world have happened. And in those shows, uh, we saw the lesbians getting raped and murdered because at the time it was important for us to show the truth of our lives. It would be disingenuous for us to tell queer stories without giving context of where we come from and conscientizing people of the realities of the peoples whose stories we are portraying. Um, I, I have also heard the queer community begging us to not just tell the story, but to tell the story of hope in the representation of who we are on screen. So I agree with young people, we need to see happy queer people on screen. Not to say it will be a false representation of that, but because it is also a truth. It is because people are trying to live their happy lives that they're being victimized, unfortunately. These are the rights that are being taken away from us. So as I'm, I'm you know, talking to the audience as I say this, as you queer people out there who are listening to this webinar are out there re, invigorated and encouraged to write your stories, please give yourself permission to show us as happy people. Show us as people that are not just having a coming out story. That's what society was about, you know? We've come out, the world knows we exist, now what? Please, to the people that are writing queer stories, because I am a firm believer that we should have queer characters in every single show on screen please make sure that those characters are not just being queer for queer sakes. Let us see them in their nuanceness, in all of us. Queer people just being themselves because straight people get to be themselves. So I know this might have sounded like it's ending on, um, on a downer, but it is because that is our truth. Um, I'm going to sign out Excuse and me. take a moment. No, no, no. I'm going to take this moment to thank you for being, for bringing your true and authentic self to this webinar. I thank you Jabu for the work that you do every day, every day, every day. I thank you Bev for the work that you do every day, every day, every day. I thank you Tishiwe for owning your truth and saying it unapologetically. I thank you Ati for having your unfiltered opinions and allowing yourself to be the discussion point for a conversation that is so important, that was so necessary. No, so necessary. And um, last but not least, I really want to thank the NFVF for agreeing to host us to have this very, very, very important conversation. To the audience that is out there that has been with us, thank you for your comments. I hope everything that you have heard has resonated with you. Please continue the conversation um, within your areas of influence. Make sure that queer people are in every conversation that you have with queer people and with straight people. I'm Makhana Mama Bolo. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. May we have happy and healthy queer storylines on our screens.
Sanessa? Yeah. We can have you as a feature. First black queer lawyer. Uh, please. I, I just feel like such a hypocrite. So I tell you, I'm not going to be able to tell you. Imagine you say, I'm not going to be able to tell you. I'm not going to be able to tell you. I'm not going to be able to tell you. I'm not Okay, then go. Go and tell your mother. Go, no, go tell your mother about us. <laughs> the National Film and Video Foundation is an agency of the Department of Arts and Culture that was created with the sole purpose to ignite stories of the South African film industry. It's a story about nurturing uniquely South African narratives through the funding of the development, production, marketing and distribution of films, festival hosting, market and festivals attendance as well as the training and development of aspiring filmmakers. Our story is about igniting your stories and we will continue to do so for as long as South Africans have stories to tell. In the past financial year, our story moved in leaps and bounds as we pursued transformation and development across all spheres of the industry. We will continue to play a leading role in addressing the needs of our stakeholders and the broader film community. Our focus towards the growth of youth and women in the industry has yielded positive results through partnerships with various provinces, strategic entities and community interventions. The National Film and Video Foundation remains committed to fueling the industry. We congratulate all the South Africans who have received both local and international accolades. We assure the industry that we will continually adhere to our duty of implementing strategic priorities with integrity, working towards improving the quality of life for every South African, while promoting equality, all through the power of the visual medium.